Hey family, it's Carlos Watson back with another fantastic show. Now coming up, gonna give you a sneak peek at our upcoming Juneteenth Live special, sponsored in part by our friends at Procter & Gamble, so be sure to stay tuned for that. It's gonna be all kinds of fire. It's exactly what you need. Today, we're also gonna do what we love to do here. That means we're gonna turn you on to the new and the next. Now look, our next guest is a game changer in the world of modeling, and that's just for starters. Now, Lena Bloom is the first openly transgender woman of color to appear in Vogue. Not only that, she's about to follow it up with an appearance in this summer's Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. But that's not all. This brilliant woman is an actress on the rise, currently appearing in the film Port Authority, also in season three of the hit show Pose. For more, here's my time with Chicago's own Lena Bloom. Yo, you gotta look around. You can't see things on just the surface level. How old were you when you realized that you wanted to transition? It wasn't this conversation about like, are you this? It was conversations about like, I know you are that. And I love it and I celebrate it. How did you end up with the Sports Illustrated thing happening? Manifestation at its greatest. The idea of me being the first person of color, of Asian and Black, of trans experience to be in that magazine, it was the universe coming full circle. What's your karaoke song? Um. <laughs> the Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey, Lena. Hi, Carlos. Where do you live now? I live in bed -Stuy. I live in Brooklyn, New York City. I used to live actually in Miami. Oh, you did? I used to live in Miami. I was out there just like modeling and I love Miami. So for some reason, I had a, a Los Angeles feel. I lived, I used to live in San Diego, Oceanside, California, um, at the military base. My dad was in the military over there. So I love like the West Coast, obviously Filipino. is a big, really, really big in the West Coast. So I just, I get out there and I try to like, you know, it's right across the water from the Philippines. Where in the Philippines is your family from? General Santos, Mindanao. It's where the Bland tribe, um, that's where my family is from, it's the Bland tribe, it's out there. And and you're, do I remember right that your dad is black and your mom's from the Philippines, is that right? Yeah, my dad's Nigerian and French and my mom's Filipino. There is something going on, Lena, because you got Sweetie, you got your girl, Her. You've got, I don't know if you're a basketball fan, but you've got Jordan Clarkson. Cassie, Nicole from the Pussycat Dolls, like so much going on with like this fusion of different cultures with black and Asian coming together, banding together and creating like these combinations of like beautiful talent and beautiful people and beautiful cultures fusing together to create music and entertainment. And both of those cultures are very, prominent and entertainment. Like you go to the Philippines, everybody sings like Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey. Like obviously people of color, black people, Spanish people are obviously just the tenacity and us um, mixed with like the different islands. It's just, it's gonna, it's gonna turn out amazing. Why do you think that mix is so, so strong and so alive there? And it's a combination of good and bad. I mean, we are the people that are being subjected to so much hostile, um, lifestyles of living in society and being policed in society, being a person of color, being queer, being trans, we're constantly subjected to things that just does not work for us. And also the fact that what does work for us is the fact that we are pure talent, we are pure innovators, we are pure intellectuals. We have so much magic in us. And um, also with the magic, we have so much people trying to police our magic and how we can navigate ourselves to get out there and show the world how beautiful and rich our culture is and it has always been, has always been kind of a challenge. I read you said, I want to make sure that we reclaim spaces that people mm. are trying to take from us. And there was such a clarity of self and kind of a love of self. Have you always had that? Um, I've always been kind of like raised in this radical mindset of, of constantly trying to like reclaim everything that I deserve and everything the world said I could not have and not relying on the system to like tell me what I deserve. I go out in the world and I change the system through the things that I do and inspire people that work for the system to see things differently. How old were you when you moved to New York? I was 17 years old when I moved to New York City. I knew at a very young age that I would move here and I wanted to like work here. I knew that this was a place where a lot of black 
people, people of color have really migrated to want better for themselves. And not just people of color, but all different walks of lives that really was like shaking the city up and like making music and making moments for us. And um, that continue that legacy, I wanted to like really tap into and like be part of that. I think what's drawing me to New York City was knowing that there's no one out there that was like me. I was all over the city, just really just like turning up, like going to the parties, going to the events, like making myself known in those spaces because there was no one like me in those spaces. So I had to represent, I had to show up with the nice hills and the beautiful hair and and be able to speak to people and talk to people and develop this 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 language of energy that is a give and take that we have that New York City is always ready for. I was just inspired by anybody that just wanted to just want more for themselves, especially people of color, especially queer people, especially trans people that were just constantly fighting for everyone and not getting what we deserve. And now we are in a time when we can and I'm not giving up. These are the black stories we've been shown again and again. But there's so much more to see. Let's widen the screen so we can widen our view. Lana, when did you know that you wanted to transition? How old were you when you realized that you wanted to transition? I don't think I remember, honestly. I just know that there was always these conversations in my kitchen about like how unique and special I am and how we need to just like explore this and like not police it at all. So my parents and my family, which is like a community of people that just was all taking care of me, they just kind of just let me do what I wanted to do and play with the toys I wanted to play with. And like, they didn't limit my creativity. They didn't limit my experience or the people that I was introduced to. They gave me the free form way to express myself individually and blossom. And these are people of color that are taught to like be basically non-existent in society, not have a voice in society. They like enhance me to like speak up for myself, speak up for my people, speak up for what I feel and ask me questions. And it wasn't this conversation about like, are you this? It was conversations about like, I know you are that and I love it and I celebrate it. And like, just know that the world around you is different and people are going to say things or envision things or put their own insecurities onto you, you have to understand how special you are and how to like have those conversations because this is the life that you're choosing to have. So I think it was just, a, I was lucky to have the family that I have and a lot of people in my position don't have that. So I hope that the next generation and me being in the positions that I am, I can inspire them to do things differently and just lead with love. W were you confident learning yourself and learning on your own or were you like, I'm not sure what I'm doing? It's a combination of both. You know, I'm learning from like the people on the trains. I got to get up at six o'clock in the morning, get five kids to take care of. I got to go up down to downtown to work a five, nine job that they don't want to work, but they got to put food on the table. I was learning from the students that was traveling across the world to like get here to learn about art and culture and creativity. I was learning from these queer bodies that are going to the ballroom scenes that have no other place to go, but they have this nuance and these ideas about what's going on in their body that they wanted to express through dance and through music and through connections of laughter. I was always, finding a place to just like learn something and like add a puzzle piece to like the bigger picture, like every single day of like, this is who I am. This is the music I'm listening to, these people I'm talking to. And it was adding to like this person, this character. So like, no matter where I go, I want to have this international language inside me that I created myself. And it was just, it was a way for me to just be universal in, 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 in some aspects. So I was surviving and dying and rebirthing all at the same time over and over and over. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly. Who has been your best ally in this life? My dad, honestly. 
I think my dad has always been kind of by my side, checking on me, reconfirming me. He was this black man um, living on the south side of Chicago who just really innately loved being a man and loved taking care of his family and loved the ideas that are wrapped around um, him going out in the world and trying to navigate himself and dealing with trials and tribulations. So he was constantly educating me on like people like Michael Max and Toni Morrison and so many different influential people of color that really had something to say and also just trying to like acknowledge that there's something that's not connecting in society and we need to like talk about this and understand why um, there's issues. When I got Sports Illustrated, I called him and I said, Dad, I got Sports Illustrated. He was like, good job, now get back to work. And how did you end up with the Sports Illustrated thing happening? That was manifestation at its greatest. That's what that was. That was me looking at Rashamba and Tyra and Naomi Beverly Johnson in those Sports Illustrated swimsuit magazines. That's me seeing so many um, indigenous women from all different walks of life in those magazines. The idea of me being the first person of color, of Asian and black, of trans experience to be in that magazine, it was truly like the universe coming full circle. My dad read those magazines, so I was looking at them as like my child going through the pages and acknowledging beauty. And then to now be in those magazines, being one of the beauties, it's just, it was powerful. I mean, when I got the phone call, I wasn't expecting it. like. I got the call and my agents like, we've been working hard for you, like CAA, we love you. We haven't booked you anything, but we did book you Sports Illustrated. I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, you booked me the job. She walked on that set and she owned it. And, and that's what I want for every woman, you know, to feel in their life. Like they have a seat at the table, they have a right to be there. When I spoke to MJ, like the first day, she just right away acknowledged the idea that like, my body, my story, my ideas, my lifestyle, the things that I talk about, the things that I work hard for, they all represent what Sports Illustrated wants in the magazines. And it was just the perfect relationship to build and to still build. And I can't wait to see who gets that cover. Hopefully I can be one of the people that can grace the cover. So we'll see what happens. As you know, I don't have to tell you, I mean, that is such a powerful achievement on your part that I'm sure there are gonna be lots of people watching trying to think about their own dreams a little bit and like how do they manifest those and how do they bring those alive? For me, it would always come down to knowing that there's people in this world that are born to do certain things. And we have to really find out what that is. We have the whole world telling us that we can't do this and we can't do that. You have to suppress this part of you to like expand this part of you. For me, it was just all about listening to myself, listening to how unique and special the music in my mind sounds and how to go out in the world and like use that sound to like bring people together. At 17 years old, um, no, I didn't have a plan, but I knew that I had a dream that was feeding me constantly. And I dealt with a lot of homelessness. I've dealt with a lot of things that trans women do in society that to survive. And I was just, I was gonna make the most out of my life. And I was going to like do things differently. I was working, I was educating myself. I spent a lot of time in the library learning about how to navigate myself in society that has been like basically put down in front of us to like live off of. So I was just bringing it all in to know that when the time was come to talk about stuff like this with people like you, um, there was this level of like respect to the craft that I wanted to make sure that I developed because the system was never working for me to learn it for myself. So I had to live it also. It's a balance of, of being strong, but it's also a balance of being patient. I just want to humanize my experience so people out in the world that are not familiar with a person like me that speaks and lives and dreams and thinks like me can see a little bit of themselves inside me as a human because we're all humans, but we're boxed into these boxes that make us like different. I never wanted to give up on myself. I wanted to just kind of stay consistent, have boundaries and like stay focused. You have to really stay focused. If something you want bad enough, you have to like think about so many different possibilities, the pros and the cons, and you have to just honestly um, just keep a tunnel vision. I, I plan on just living for today and knowing that there's things that I want to do, and if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I just have to just keep trying. Oh.
Okay, so what's your name? Paul. I'm Y. When did you know you liked me? Who says I like you? Congratulations uh, on the film. How involved were you even in the conception of the film, or did they bring you in once they decided to greenlight it? How did that come about? I auditioned for Port Authorities um, a year before I actually was selected to be in the film. At the time when I first auditioned, literally so many trans women of color around the world were all auditioning at the same time. And I was actually told no, not once, not twice, but three times before I got the part. So they were really making sure that they looked at everyone. They wanted to make sure that everyone got a chance to tell the story about love. I was actually in Italy at the time, and we had a FaceTime meeting with the director, Daniel Lezovitz, who's also the writer. And we just talked to each other. It was like talking to like a girlfriend of mine or talking to like a mentor of mine or talking to, just to a, a family member. It was really organic and just natural. We we're talking about the complexities of masculine and feminine and like how they're intersectional in every walks of life and how we can tell the story through those ideas. And it was just really purely organic. And she asked me about my story and there were certain nuances about my story that she wanted to add to the character. So you'll see in the movie, you know, everything. It's just like, why is just a combination of a lot of different people. And I'm happy I got a chance to tell her story. When we have people in sports, we have people in film, we have people in fashion, we have people in politics, all having these conversation about the world is changing and how we can celebrate each other. I think we're in a powerful time. And I think this film, Port Authority, exemplifies what's happening right now, today, and tomorrow. I know we only have 60 seconds, but I want to try something I call rapid fire. What's your favorite movie of all time? Leon the Professional. Most beautiful place you've ever been to? Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. What's your karaoke song? <laughs> Anything by Tony Braxton. What's the ultimate movie role or TV role that you would love to have in the future? Cleopatra and I'm a Bea James Bond girl. Lena, thank you so much for coming on the show. I love that we're in a time right now where we can have these conversations. Thank you so much for everything, Carla. Peace and love. Lena Bloom, crew thoughts. Take one, Parker. She, she was like glowing. She was cool. She had this like really radiant energy. A lot of talking about like positivity and the beauty within like the community. And I think this conversation was important. I think what we witnessed is what happens when you learn how to harness your soul. To me, that, that's where the confidence comes from, is, is that she's convinced herself so many times that it's not what anybody else's narrative they place on her, it's the narrative that she's placing on herself. And um, you can feel that. Yeah. And one can only wish that we would all have the courage to stand up at the same time and do the same thing. I loved her spirit and I'm proud of her. You know that she's gorgeous. <laughs> I was jealous of her hair, you know, did all of the things, but she's important. And what she's doing is that it's just, it's going to change the dynamic. You know, she, I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> you can't deny yeah, me now, yeah, you know? Yeah. The word illustrator, it, it, it probably does get bigger vote. If she lands the vote, yeah, that's pretty yeah. big too, but yeah. just what she's doing is important. Everybody has the right to belong in, yeah. a, in any space. Yeah. And she's basically saying that without saying it, you know? Yeah. She's undeniable. I love people like that, yeah. you know? So I hope to see more of her. I hope she lands that Vogue spot. To me, it was inspiring how she's taken the responsibility to be a spokesperson, to try to create change and, and you know, acceptance. I think it's amazing. Yeah, and what an unusual scenario it sounded like how supportive her dad is. That was, that was to me a big thing. And I've noticed there's a common thing. People who are really successful have the huge support of their family. I think that's like a big thing. Yeah. That acceptance growing up, that is not the usual experience for trans people, especially young trans people. Too many are thrown out by their families. They have to make their way on the street. And that's why too many I believe get involved in um, sex work on the street. It, um, it's a sad story, but it's one of the things that makes us really strong people. We're here because we're here, not because anybody said we could be, or any, we're here because a lot of people said we couldn't be, and yet we're here. You know, get over it, we're here. I think it's only in the uh, 
messed up Western Judeo-Christian morality. That transness kind of got pushed under the cover in Western culture. We've always been there too. Did you know of her before today? Oh, I may have seen, you know, a, a little story somewhere about the first trans person on Sports Illustrated. I mean, that's a really big deal. Uh, she wouldn't be the first Bond girl. There was a trans Bond woman, I think, in the 80s. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, she was English. Yeah, like I said, we've been here, you know, yeah. just now we're fi finally starting to be uh, given a little bit of spotlight. Yeah. Hey, I hope you enjoyed Lena Bloom. What an interesting and fascinating person. Bold, creative, uh, ready to change the world, changing the world already. And love the story of her dad. Very much appreciate him and what he did for her and probably for many others. All right, listen, now, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're excited to commemorate Juneteenth this year with our very own Juneteenth Live special. It's airing this Friday, June the 18th. You don't want to miss it. The special is brought to you in part by Procter & Gamble. And for a sneak peek at the kind of compelling conversations that we'll be featuring, take a look at this. Hey. When I say the American dream, what do you hear? What do you think? Wow, that's very interesting. Carlos, I don't hear anything. I don't think I hear anything. And I think the hard part for me is, I mean, I, I hear what other people say. So I hear, you know, um, white picket fence, you know what I mean? Uh, two car garage, two kids, dog, and, and, and that sort of thing. But it's not like emotionally, I, you know, I, I can't really emote anything original into that. You know, that that's so powerful when you say you don't hear anything. There was a great film back in the 1950s called 12 Angry Men. You ever see mm -hmm. that film? They remade it. I read that. I had to read the screenplay when I was in yeah, school. It was a great moment with Henry Fonda, an argument in the jury room, and he says to another guy, he can't hear you. If we did start this country afresh, if we said what's happened the last 250 years has been America 1.0, but we now need to all be able to hear something and we need America 2.0. And so we're gonna try to reset America. Reimagine this new experiment, or at least give me one or two of the things that you hope you would bring to a reset America and America 2.0 effort. I would say no statues, no statues and no commemorative art or anything that deifies. I would probably get away from the term founding fathers and founding mothers in and of itself. And the reason why is because um, I think ideals are probably much more important than the people, you know, who, who bring forth those ideals. Because on, in ex on examination, inevitably what you'll find is that, you know, that person wasn't worth a statue. <laughs> who can be worth a statue? You know what I mean? Who, who, can, who can really, you know, do that on examination? And so, you know, I think the idea of egalitarian democracy, um, I think that's just the bottom line, that everyone deserves an equal chance to participate in determining the destiny of the state. Everyone deserves to participate in determining the destination, you know, of, of the state. I, I'm going to start there from healthcare, from anti-racism. I think a lot of things flow, you know, um, anti-misogyny automatically flow from that presumption. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. Be sure to join us on Friday, June the 18th for our Juneteenth Live special. It's going to be all kinds of good. We go live at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Listen, that's our show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hitting the like and subscribe button. And if you haven't done it, go ahead and do it. Treat yourself. You deserve it. All right, listen, be safe, be well. See you on the other side.